Welcome, everybody, to this episode of Beyond the Crucible. I'm Gary Schneeberger, the co-host of the show and the communications director for Crucible Leadership. And you have clicked play on, uh, we hope you've clicked subscribe to, uh, a podcast that deals in what we refer to as crucible experiences. Now, crucible experiences are those things in life, tragedies, setbacks, failures, traumas, things that happen to you, sometimes things that happen because of decisions that you make. But what they all have in common is that they're painful, that they not the wind out of you. They take the wind out of your sails. They can change the trajectory of your life. But here's the good news. We talk about these experiences here on Beyond the Crucible, not so we can light a fire, sit around the campfire and trade war stories and feel bad for ourselves and wallow in them. We talk about them because we want to share the hope that they can be overcome that we can learn the lessons of our crucibles, we can apply those lessons to our lives, and we can move, as the title of the show says, beyond our crucibles. And the host of the show is the founder of Crucible Leadership. I have called him sometimes the Lego master of Crucible Leadership. You'll know why I'm about to call him the piano maestro of Crucible Leadership in a minute. But it's Warwick Fairfax. Warwick, welcome. Uh, great to be here. Uh, very much looking forward to it. I use the piano metaphor, listener, because today's guest is um, is a is a piano master. Today's guest is Dr. Y.L. Farouk, who has performed on five continents in such venues as the White Hall in Saint Petersburg, Schumann's House in Leipzig, and Wheel Recital Hall at Carnegie Hall in New York City where his solo debut performance in 2013 was described as absolutely masterful. Praised as formidable and magnificent as a pianist by the New York Concert Review, Dr. Farouk has had an extensive performing career. He commands a vast repertoire of more than 70 concertos and 60 solo programs spanning from Scarlatti to Baroque to Balcom and including the complete piano works of Bach, Beethoven, Schumann, Chopin, Brahms, Debussy, and Rachmaninoff. And Dr. Farouk, I apologize, I probably pronounced some of those incorrectly. Dr. Farouk is known for his groundbreaking performance projects and vast repertoire. From 2014 to 2018, he performed 30 different recital programs, including the complete solo piano works of Rachmaninoff and Brahms, as well as the complete piano chamber music of Brahms. Dr. Farouk directs the piano program at Carthage, at Carthage College and the Carthage Arts Academy in Kenosha, Wisconsin. He is also on the artist faculty of the Chicago College of the Performing Arts at Roosevelt University. He frequently judges competitions, teaches and performs in festivals, and delivers master classes. On a recent tour in China, his performances and master classes were in high demand. As a teacher, Dr. Farouk believes in cultivating each student's own artistic voice while empowering them with a solid technical foundation. Within a short time, his students routinely demonstrate tremendous artistic and technical growth. Students work with Dr. Farouk on learning a large repertoire from early Baroque to contemporary composers. Welcome, Dr. Farouk and Warwick. I know uh, you will, uh, I know our listeners will really enjoy this conversation that you're going to have with Dr. Farouk for sure. Well, thank you so much for the wonderful introduction and my pleasure to be here. Well, well, thank you so much for being here. Um, I mean, just to have somebody of your, uh, I don't know what the, maybe passion and love and talent for playing music and just bringing music to future generations, well, current generations and future generations. It's really a, a gift that you have and that you're giving. Uh, but I'd like to go back to... Um, you were you know, born in Egypt, I understand, and from a Coptic Christian family. So talk a bit about growing up because, you know, I'm sure life is not easy growing up in, in that 
environment, but it was particularly challenging for you because you had some physical challenges from birth. So you had challenges that other kids you knew didn't have that you played with. So talk a bit about growing up in Egypt and just some of those challenges in the environment that you had. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, as you mentioned, I was born and grew up a Coptic Christian in, in Egypt. And um, it is not the easiest um, um, environment, let's say, to grow up in being uh, a Christian, especially in the 80s. Um, however, um, both my parents who grew up in the 40s and 50s had even more challenges, if you could imagine. Um, but without um, that kind of, of, of challenges, I was born with very unusual um, eyes and hand situations that um, it took uh, literally um, years and decades for me to understand and for my parents to understand what are they. And um, for example, my hands were very, very um, unusually small. Um, I have um, very short finger ligaments till, till this day I am unable to make a fist. Uh, mm -hmm. It's challenging for me to do, you know, some buttons and to open jars and stuff like that. Um, it took me several years to be able to put on my own contact lenses <laughs> uh, because before that, due to my eye uh, condition, I used to wear those, what do you call them? Um, Coke bottles, bottom, uh, very, very, very right. glasses, right? So, in regards to my eyes, I was born with um, my both inner lenses are completely detached from their holding case, and they are actually shifted, they're tilted, and the ligaments that are um, holding them are very. Um, the medical term that I was given by my ophthalmologist, they're practically torn, so they're not really there. So bending down, running, skipping, jumping um, is off the table. Um, and I, you know, I'm one of the few lucky people that their doctor told them you should never exercise, right? Because of, <laughs> because. <laughs> of so, um, however, again, growing up in Egypt in the eighties, it was in a way difficult to to place or to really understand and unravel all of these issues, right? Um, I, I've seen like a normal child, yes, small and in build and, and size, but the, the hand situation is really what I am thankful for and got me where I am today because um, around two and a half years old, when my parents really realized that I am an unable to use my hands on any on any level, unable to hold bo bottles, cups, you know, spoons, etc. And not realizing my poor eyesight, I wasn't even seeing where I'm dropping things. So my dad took me to a physician a little bit before my third birthday and saying, you know, he cannot really use, use his hands as there's something that can be done, you know, the fourth and fifth fingers on both hands are quite curved, you know, not, not really straight. And a wise old uh, doctor um, said, you know, you absolutely leave him alone. You don't do anything to those hands. Mm. Let him practice it somehow, get him a rubber ball, get him, um, you know, a, a toy where it involves a lot of, you know, pulling and 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 grabbing that type of thing so and you know let it be no injections no surgeries just let it be natural he's born like that for a reason and let it be so luckily my my dad both my parents really who knew nothing about about music nothing about you know classical music per se because it is not the most popular language in egypt as you can um imagine he got me for my third birthday at teeny tiny toy piano uh, he thought you know all right here is something for his hand to use is something for you know um, he doesn't have to carry it doesn't have to drop it etc so since the age of three that little toy piano became my best friend my companion in a way um, 
fast forwarding a little bit by the age of five i started playing um at churches because i was in a way able to play tunes that i could hear on the radio or on tv and you know we are we were devoted church goers so i always you know had hymns and and coptic chants on my head so i was able to play that on on the keyboard no problem and of course you know i i got promoted a little bit so i ended up getting a bigger keyboard than my fourth birthday and then a bigger <laughs> one on my first my fifth birthday etc by the age i was six i was playing regularly for the coptic pope um weekly services uh in in the main cathedral which is a big deal in many ways uh because in the coptic church uh they don't really allow instrumental music it is very monophonic it's very uh just only human voices and that's it so being um uh, really the only person who's allowed to play an instrument and a digital instrument that is was quite was quite something back then so anyway um that was my my early experience with music and um by six or seven i had to get those very 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 thick glasses that in a way prevented me from being outside playing but i still was very happy content practicing my music uh, by the age of eight um several people who heard me and met my father said you know he should be really studying seriously because there is something there and he can he can have you know he can have a, a future in music he should take him to this place that's called the conservatory and he should enroll there and sure so anyway, my dad uh, took me there one day and we learned that there is something called entrance exams and then there is a panel and you have to detest your, your, your ear and if you have a good musical pitch, etc. They look at your hand, etc. So I placed the highest in terms of those entrance exams, but because of my hand size, the dean of the conservatory, who is an excellent pianist, told my father there is not even a 1% chance in heaven that your son will be a pianist. Mm -hmm. These hands are not meant for the piano. Uh, you are going to destroy him psychologically, physically. This is not for him. He should be a doctor, should be a lawyer, should be something else, but definitely not that. So my dad, who also grew up Coptic Egyptian, but very, very hard working he was the first in his family to go to college when he was six his father left the family of five and my dad worked two jobs when he was in elementary school supporting the family uh often going down to to the streets studying under a lamppost because they did not have an electricity he told the dean well if you say he's talented then you 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 should give him a chance and that was it, in a way. Uh, they gave me a three months trial period, a grace period, and they really tried to make those three months very demanding, so I would just drop the ball <laughs> and quit. Uh, so basically, they expected me to do the work of two years in those three months. But being stubborn, being encouraged by my dad, who, who has incredible work ethic and life experience, I was able to stay. I graduated with the top marks you know in the history of the school and those professors who told my dad he will never be a mm -hmm. pianist they they all come to my concerts when i go back to egypt perform <laughs> annually with the symphony and they're all you know very supportive and and they are comfortable saying you know we, we are very glad that you proved us wrong boy that is a remarkable story i mean there's just so many fascinating elements um I mean, one of the things, obviously, as you look back, I mean, you were given a lot of challenges, but you were also perhaps given a gift in your family and your parents, because certainly in, in many cultures and certainly in many in days gone by, I think of, um, well, you know, back in the era of Franklin Roosevelt, as you know, had polio. Back then it was considered, you know, we're talking before the 50s and you know it was almost shameful like if you had polio somehow it was your fault and you were meant to sit inside and do nothing and it was just and so I, I don't know about in the culture you grew up in but sometimes when you have a challenge rather than helping it's like well you just need to be quiet and 
and just be inside and not really doing anything. I mean, I don't know if that was true in culture you grew up in, but but your parents weren't like that. Your parents were saying, no, we will do our level best to help Wael, you know, we'll, to help him have a, a good life. And I mean, not every parent would have reproached it with the, the level of determination and encouragement as your parents did and your dad did. Absolutely. And I cannot agree more. And um, I mean, I can give you examples from here till next month, but unfortunately we don't have time <laughs> but um my, my parents did not have much money to be, to begin with um they still wanted to make sure that we had the best education my brother and i my parents you know sold items so they can mortgage a piano for me when i went to the conservatory uh which i did not get a piano till my fifth year with I mean, I did not have an instrument to practice at home, uh, oh. which is very, you know, unusual. Um, they all, all the way through, they were extremely supportive, extremely encouraging, extremely. But what I appreciate more now that being a parent, um, that they didn't try to to put me in a bubble. They didn't, you know, shun me from the world and try to overprotect me or over shelter me, which, you know, would have had understandable reasons, but would have had also repercussions later on. But they are very um, supportive. I mean, all the way till, till my mother's last breath. I mean, she was very helpful, very encouraging, would not let you that this is um, causing somebody else's pain, never once worried about what I'm doing, never once saying, you know, what is this classical music stuff? What is this a piano thing? Why don't you just, you know, get a job in the government or do whatever? I'm used to practice 13, 14, 15 hours a day in my in my teens. They never disturbed me once. They never bothered me once. They never said, you know, you should take a break and go watch TV or go to the movies or why don't you have, you know, so none whatsoever. It was providential, and I think without my parents, you kind of summarize this yourself. Without my parents, I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have been here, and I cannot imagine what other life I would have rather have. And you raise such a good point that, you know, sometimes when you have these challenges, your parents understandably they want to protect you, keep you safe, you know, put you in like a little cotton ball or something and which you know they might have the best of motives but that's not helpful you want to you know help people have not a normal life because what's normal but you know live with other people and i think about that doctor i mean there's a lot of doctors that would either have said oh there's no hope or we're going to do all the surgery but yet you had a doctor that was wise enough to say you know what don't touch him no injections, let him be, you know, let him use the hands. I mean, that also was providential, right? You could have Absolutely. had other doctors that would have done, I don't know, maybe terrible things. Absolutely. You know? And both him and my other eye doctor, um, they didn't really have, again, you know, the latest x-ray technology. They didn't run tests. They didn't use me as a study case they didn't whatever. I mean, he... Again, I was three, so I barely remember the incident with my optimo, um, optom, optom, sorry, with my ophthalmologist, whom I yeah. saw a few years later. I remember a little more of that, but as you said, um, there are it's, there are incidents in your life that you go back and you say, "Well, I'm really, really thankful for that." And speaking of which, ironically, almost ten days ago. I got an email from the president of the American Association of Hand Surgeons who said, well, you know, I read an article about you and I got to hear some of your recordings. And by the way, Rachmaninoff happens to be my favorite composer. <laughs> well, may we invite you to be our feature guest speaker in our annual conference in California so you can speak to the hand surgeons and, you know, they can ha they wow. probably have a couple questions for you. And <laughs> said, I promise we're not going to do anything for your hands. Just, you know, <laughs> look at it and ask you a few questions. So kind of a funny coincidence. Yeah, I suppose it would be tempting to say, look, I respect what you do, but 
don't be too, too quick to operate, you know? Right. Exactly. <laughs> but anyway, um, so I guess another question I have is, again, obviously it's providential that your dad could have said, okay, yeah, the, a little rubber ball, okay, that'd be good, just throw it up against the wall in your room and mm -hmm. hand-eye coordination, or I don't know quite what, but somehow he picked a piano. And mm -hmm. what was it, because, you know, very often, as you would know better than me, if, if you're musical, there's a history of music in your family. I don't know, it's not always, but it's so often the case, you know, mm -hmm. and that whether it's genetic or cultural or both. But in your case, there weren't other examples of that. So talk about from age three through five, what about the piano and music just fascinated you so much so that from then all through the teens, you were playing 12, 14 hours a day. What about music and the piano just captured your heart, if you will? Yeah. Well, that's an excellent question. Uh, I think my parents, my dad especially, always loved music and wanted to study music himself, but instead he ended up in the military and um, getting a degree in accountant. Um, the it's interesting with music especially or any form of arts that one specializes in from a young age you see all of those angles of life you are going to kind of, as if you are going on a merry-go-round in a way and it all centers around this subject but however during different stages in your life your relationship with it not necessarily change but the frame of it really changed uh, so, you know, between three and five, that was my, you know, hobby, that was my playtime, that was my, that's what I just did. Uh, from five to eight, that's, you know, it became more um, exposure period, if you will. I was playing on TV almost every week. I played on almost in all of the churches in Cairo, which there are a lot of churches, and when I started studying at the conservatory, I realized, um, again, thanks to another um, wonderful parent, if you will, one of my teachers who really told me the fact early on. He said, listen, you have a disadvantage with your hands, but if you want to be a professional pianist, this is a serious job. You need to work eight to nine hours a day, just like your dad goes to work eight to nine hours a day. This is not a funny business. This is not a hobby. Obviously, he was very serious. He was Russian, and he, you know, he was <laughs> really one of the best teachers in the world. Right. And I am thankful for that because not only he gave me the fact straight, but he said, you know, it's very difficult to be a pianist here. Listen to this recording. And that recording was of Rahman of third piano concerto. And then I listened to it, and then the next day I was just a different person. I went to him, I said, I have to play that piece one day. This is when I was, you know, 13 or so. And he said, no way in heaven. I am twice as big as you are. My hands are three times bigger than you. I still don't have the courage to play a piece like that. And, you know, again, being stubborn, being, you know, um, not bothering much with, with somebody telling you what you can or cannot do. I, that's when I worked, you know, my tails off for 14, 15 hours a day. And three or four years later, here I am playing. That was the Cairo Symphony, First Egyptian. And that piece it still runs in my life till now, till next week, as you know, about this big uh, project we are doing. And if it wasn't for that Rahmanov piece that was, you know, the hardest, really the Mount Everest of the repertoire, again, I wouldn't probably been continue to be a pianist. I wouldn't be where I am where I am today. I didn't find the urge of of provoking success from yourself. And I think that's one of the things you and Gary mentioned in your introduction. These challenges, these difficulties, these uh, crucibles. They are there because really we need them in many ways. Uh, they provoke success in you. They, they teach you more about yourself. They teach you more about life. And if there are closed doors, but they also, they direct you to the open doors, which ultimately end up being the right ones for you. And some people have the, the, the concept or at least the, the, 
the naive hope that once you experience one or two difficulties in life, that's it, and then your career is set, your path is set, and then you are on 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 smooth, you know, water. For it's absolutely not. And I think uh, there are certain things that gives you the 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 challenge and gives you the option and gives you the choice whether you let them define you and to be i don't want to say a victim of because i don't use this word lightly to be um just a reactionary in your in your life in your decisions and what you choose to do what you choose to to represent and what you choose your life's work to be about or you can make it work for what you want to accomplish and you find it as an opportunity and it also teaches you to be grateful because without having sufferings without having challenges if you're handed everything so easily so effortlessly the concept of being grateful the concept of responsibility the concept of working hard even harder to protect what you gained and what you achieved i don't think it, it crystallizes as much Boy, I mean, you said so many profound things there. Uh, hard to know where to start. But yeah, I mean, it's almost without the darkness, you don't appreciate the light without the challenges in life. It's hard to be grateful if life is always perfect. And, you know, young some young people have been through some challenges. I know you teach it in college and college, college. But there'll be some people that grow up in great families. They're not particularly poor and everything's fine. And Maybe they haven't. Maybe life isn't tough right now, but it will be. Nobody goes through life without any challenges. But Absolutely. I mean, just so many things that are remarkable about your story, and that it's hard. Nobody thinks of a crucible as a gift, but sometimes there can be a gift amidst the pain. You know, nobody wants those. But when you think about it, if you were, you know, had the same physical attributes as a lot of your friends, maybe you would have played soccer or thrown a ball or who knows, or become a doctor or a lawyer, which nothing wrong with that. That's an honorable profession. But when there are so many things that you can't do, you know, whether it's physically or, you know, worried about attached retina, it's like, well, what can I do? Well, it's pretty limited, right? <laughs> then I have this piano and I can do that well and it gives me joy. Right. Sometimes narrowing the options there's a, a blessing amidst the pain. Does that kind of make sense? I mean, you wouldn't have designed your life that way, but yet if you had had all these other choices, maybe you never would have played the piano, right? Absolutely. And, you know, uh, rocks directs water and it, it, it determines in a way that where the current is going, where the, but also river carves its own way and even though sometimes you try to reverse <laughs> its directions it, it doesn't always go your way but i i am a firm believer that um because of my faith not only uh again thanks to my family um uh, but to where i am today and and some of the incidents that both my family and i were been experiencing over the past two years it brings some comfort at least that there is a pattern in one's life that despite challenges despite you won't call it persecution oppression this or that you know that there is a light at the end of the tunnel you know that challenges make you stronger they make you learn about yourself and i think it is a gift for anybody who is a teacher because it's one thing to teach information to teach digits to teach mm -hmm. you know, you play the right notes, you play the right rhythm, you read this, the style of Baroque or classical. This is all peanuts. This is all peanuts. What you teach about life is really what makes or breaks a person. And we need more, more and more of that. Right. I want I mean, to jump in at this point, if I can, and, uh, and do a couple things. One, um, the story that you referred to uh, that sort of kicked off some of the media coverage that you've been giving mm -hmm. uh, is in the local newspaper, the Kenosha News. And I'm just going to take this opportunity to say to listeners who've heard us talk to at least four people from Australia, uh, like Warwick, <laughs> that uh, that YL and I both live in Kenosha, Wisconsin. So I was thrilled when I read his story in the local newspaper one Saturday morning. I got a hold of Warwick immediately. 
you know, and said, this, this gentleman will be fantastic uh, for our podcast. But one of the things, Wyal, that you said in that story goes along with what you were just talking about and that, and also gets to the other source of strength that you found. And you said this in that story, when my parents realized my hand disabilities and later learned when I was seven, that I have very severe disability with my eyes and vision, they always prayed and told me that they trusted that God had a very good reason why he made me like this. And I am in his hands. My family and my faith taught me that God will never allow evil to hurt me and that everything will be for my good and for his glory. So that's part of your perspective, right? Your faith informs your perspective that these things that are crucibles are meant not for evil, but for, for good in your life. Absolutely. And I am so glad that um, you brought this up. Um, because, you know, Psalm 23, for example, that's where um, I try to build my life on, I think, over and over again, because we are doubtful. And we also forget quickly, and we are very sensitive to negative experiences. And we are very sensitive to these challenges and sufferings. But remembering, as I was saying earlier, remembering that there is a pattern, remembering that you will always be delivered, and remembering that gold is tested with fire and you are more refined at the end, uh, is something I look forward to. And if I may read you just a small... Um, a small verse from probably my favorite hymn, if that's okay. Yes, I think please. it will encapsulate yeah. what I'm trying more, more, more accurately. Um, it says, make me a captive, Lord, and then I shall be free. Force me to render up my sword, and I shall conqueror be. I sink in life's alarms when by myself I stand. Imprison me within thine arms, and strong shall be my hand. Mm. And for me, that's that. And, and what, what hymn was that? It's an old hymn uh, from um, the Presbyterian, okay. uh, yeah, Presbyterian yeah, yeah. canon. Uh, I'm happy to share with you the yeah, yeah, yeah. link later. Um, no, that's, that's awesome. Um, you know, it, it's funny. I, I think also of of Joseph's story that you know, obviously you can probably identify with him. He you know went to Egypt and uh, suffered persecution there. Uh, and there's this great line. I think it's in Genesis 50, which I know you're very very familiar with. Is you know he talks about they meant it for evil and God meant it for good. And for listeners, you may not be familiar with the story. Uh, Joseph was a little. Uh, Bit arrogant, but full of himself when he was young, and his um, brothers got a bit jealous, threw him in a pit, and eventually sold him into slavery. Yeah. And he was falsely accused in Egypt of doing things he didn't, but eventually he found favor with the Pharaoh, and um, life turned around. But he could have been angry and bitter when he met his brothers for what they did, which was sometimes we don't fully appreciate what the Bible says. I mean, it's a horrific thing to be sold into slavery. Right. at all, but by your family. I mean, it's just unthinkable. But yet he wasn't bitter and angry. So that's sort of amazing to me. So as I look at some of the things you've, you've been through, I sense both with you and your family, I'm, I'm guessing there wasn't a whole lot of bitterness. I mean, you know, you haven't gone into detail, but I know I'm sure life for Coptic Christians in Egypt and, you know, even today, you know, you read about over the last several years, bombings and persecution and uh, sadly human beings intolerance towards each other. It's hard to fathom or understand, but it's somewhat universal, but yet I don't sense a whole lot of bitterness. I may be wrong. I mean, there's, as, as I often say, there's a difference between condoning and forgiving. You can condemn and not condone and, hope that justice will prevail at the same time and not let bitterness 
destroy you, if that makes sense. Absolutely. And I, I very much would like to clarify, as I did in the Kenosha article, um, that since 2014, um, this picture is radically changing. The current president, who's been very, very good to Christians, probably the first in the history of this country that went through so much and you know christians now are are being um not only respected and protected and they're asked their input in the constitution and you know your your uh religion is no longer required to be listed in your id or in things like that um however the theme i decided to give this um project which i'm happy to to you know to call it probably the most important concert I'm about to give, both artistically, humanly, and personally, because these recent recent events that happened in my life, it, it actually did not have to do much with Egypt, but it has to do much with my experience being here in the States. And it, it brings a familiar tune because you are treated... Um, based on, on what you represent or whom you are or where are you from rather than your work, which, of course, you know, the United States always represented for me and my family this this shelter, this sanctuary, and um, what is written in the Statue of Liberty is something, to be honest, I thought I would never experience here in this again, great country that I'm proud to call my adopted country, but it, it was surprising in a way. It was shocking, I could say. It was um, unexpected, but at the same time, being in it for three, four, five years now, I am kind of reminded of a familiar tune, if you will. And um, I am hopeful uh, as, you know, I was guided through many, many complicated the path in my earlier life that this also will prevail and things will will end up positively and will end up both for me and for what I represent um, in the right way. So uh, obviously, to whatever level you're comfortable with, just help us understand a little bit about some of these more recent challenges. Sure. So as you know, um, and I would like to share this with our listeners, the, the concert that I'm giving next week. Yes. Um, on April 8th, um, we're playing three Rachmaninoff concerti in one evening, numbers one, two, and three. And number three alone, um, I mentioned a little bit of my background, but number three alone is undisputedly uh, nicknamed as the Mount Everest of the piano literature. So to play this one on its own is already, you know, nerve-wracking enough, but to play also the other two musical mountains, the first and the second piano concerto right before that, is really um, an experience that, first of all, is unprecedented and, and an experience for me that I'll never forget. But I wanted to tie this into a theme of, of not only what I was going through personally, uh, but also what the country seems to be going through lately. Um, the three musical mountains um, to overcoming three social injustices, persecution, oppression, and discrimination. Um, I, I am comfortable sharing, you know, a few, few backgrounds, few details uh, in terms of... Can I jump I, in? Yes, please. Because I don't want to interrupt you when you get yes. into that, but I yes. want listeners to understand you probably got really sad when uh, YL said April 8th and you're like, this isn't airing till after that. I can't hear it. Ah, yes, you can. Look at the show notes. Um, this will be on a live stream uh, link that you can uh, listen to up until June 15th. So you will have the chance to hear his performance. So please don't be saddened by the fact that as we're recording this, he is yet to perform. He will perform. It'll be online. You can see it then. I just wanted to make sure people knew that so they didn't miss wow. it. Thank you so much for clarifying that. I appreciate that. Um, when you are, let's say, um, 
I grew up expected uh, in Egypt that I would be persecuted for being a Christian. I would have opportunities taken away from me, even though you earned them. You expected that you'll be bullied, that you'll even be failed, and you know to to have somebody else um, who is not, you know, a Coptic Christian that should be in the lead rather than whatever your work is trying to be obstructed, have blocking your foreign tours. Uh, just because, you know, why should you get them because you deserve them, something like that. So all of this was expected. Uh, however, this is not really expected here, is it? Um, and definitely not because of what you represent in terms of standing up for what you believe is correct, for um, standing up against you know, those who abuse their powers and standing up against those who um, bully you and those who discriminate you and openly um, treat you differently just because you are from a different part of the world or because what you believe in or because your, your work or because your work speaks for itself and because you are not only successful in what you do, but that in a way could shine bad light on what they do or you know in terms of i don't want to draw a comparison but discrimination or or oppression really has no logic right so you mm -hmm. don't really need any anything to to logically trigger these these um these actions these decisions so um i Persevered. I am. I am still being patient. I'm still going through the the right channels. My wife's support is, is immense. My family's support is immense. There are difficult moments. A lot of a lot of hurt, both physically, mentally, emotionally. But you know, these scars are also going to be good for the future. And you know, you get you get over them one way or another with time, with, with, uh, with therapy, with whatever it is. But um, it is a battle I am, I am happy to have, especially where it comes to defining who you are and who, what, you, what you represent or what you want your, your work to be about. So um, with an you know, with with that, I decided it will be fitting uh, and again providential that this is the one concert that was not canceled due to the virus and to the pandemic mm -hmm. for a kind of mountain concert, and this seemed to be quite fitting to give it that. Theme. Just so listeners understand a little bit, and again, I, I know you probably don't want to get to every detail, but is it discrimination based on? that you're Egyptian from the Middle East, people make certain assumptions about everybody from the Middle East believes a certain way. I mean, is that kind of, you look different, they assume you believe different. Is it is it that kind of territory or? It's all of the above, exactly. Yeah, so everybody from the Middle East must be evil or, you know, that kind of mentality, you know? Uh, yeah, and... Uh recent events especially that happened in our, our own backyard in kenosha in july right um also you know really uh what was was an alarming wake-up call in a way that we need to be careful and we need to be how not that we need to be careful how how labeling people could make us really pay dearly down the road and sometimes we are too polite even to defend on ourselves or to correct somebody's misassumptions or just asking questions back or really, for a lack of a better word, defending oneself that could be viewed or skewed as being, you know, aggressive or as being, as being, you know, irrational or as being whatever. But if, if clarification or seeking truth becomes secondary to anything, we will pay dearly. And I'm not just talking about those who are in certain minorities. I mean, if history taught us anything, few, just a little bit of, 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 of drifting from the right path will cost 
will cost us dearly. So I am, yes. I am glad that again, this has been put in my life. I don't understand those reasons right now, uh, but I am, as my faith has taught me, as past experiences has taught me, I'm sure it's for the good. I'm sure it will also help me be stronger. I will understand myself better. Um, I think the crucibles in my in my childhood brought me where I am today. The crucibles I'm facing right now will kind of determine where to go from here. Does that make well? It sounds like you're approaching it with courage and conviction. And it's hard to understand why intolerance, hatred, because of differences. It's hard to understand where that comes from. I mean, from a faith perspective, I guess we're you know there's a lot of darkness in uh, the soul of humanity, but it's it's always hard to understand, I have to say, but it's been a reality, uh, certainly in our current times and before. Um, so thank you for sharing that. And so talk a bit about this concert. Um, I mean, I love how you're combining both your love for music as well as, you know, to stand up for, for justice against discrimination, oppression, and persecution. You know, one of the other things I wanted to come back to is when somebody says to you, well, oh, that's impossible. You can't do it. Don't even try. Give up. That's almost like, now that you've said that, then I have to try it, right? <laughs> it's like, you know, somewhere I think I read that Rachmaninoff was, I don't know, what, 6366, some massive size and, you know, massive wingspan and probably huge hands. And so it's fine to, for him to write concertos that he can play, but what about the rest of humanity? <laughs> you know, I guess he didn't really care about that. Hey, I'm good. I can play my own music. Yeah. Um, but you would take on something that you, music teacher said, give it up, well, you'll never do it. Yeah. But yet it's almost like this challenge that's, so talk about why, when somebody says it's impossible for you, why, why that becomes like this lightning rod, this challenge, this rallying cry. Here we go. Let's go for it. Why right. does that, what, you know, tell, tell me about how does that happen for you? Sure. Um, I haven't been asked this before, so it will take me a little bit to get there. Uh, I'm happy to answer it. It's a great question. I think it, I need to answer this question to verbalize it for myself. Uh, but to touch quickly about what you just said about, you know, um, what goes on and what we cannot really understand why those things happen and darkness um, in, in humanity, etc. But the theme of your show, and I like to think that this is the theme of my life too, that I know that good will prevail no matter what. Good will prevail. If history has taught us anything over and over and over and over, Again, good will prevail. And those who do think that they have a green light to, you know, abuse, discriminate, just don't overestimate your 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 dark powers. Mm -hmm. And for those who go through similar times as I am and as many others, don't underestimate your strength and your power and the power of good because if you have good on your side that's it and i know it is it may see as an oversimplification but this is not at all and whether we choose to acknowledge it or discuss it but it seems to be the theme of humanity that's why hmm. all of the movies almost is about either good or evil right and which right, one will right. die at the end so i just hmm. wanted to throw that in there but yeah. now back to your back to your question yeah. um when, of course, when I was young or, or, or recently, um, when I decided to take on these projects or to take on these, you know, massive uh, programming, it is not at all that I want to try to prove anything because if there is anything to be proven, it's just for oneself because at the end of the day, when you put your head down to sleep, it's your conscience artistic or personal or human or moral that's what counts that's what will keep you awake at night or that's what will give you peace of mind um when i am told for example when i was young um you know you cannot really do this you cannot play rahman of third you never be a pianist 
I don't read the future. Uh, none of us can. Um, and of course, these are experts that I respect and, you know, admire. But at the same time, I guess what processes into my head, which I believe is your question, is, all right, don't let, don't seal my fate yet. Let me, just give me, let's take a look at this. Give me an opportunity, give me a chance. And no matter how long it will take, if this doesn't really work, it will be folly of me to lie to lie to myself because this is the worst kind of lie, right? When you lie to yourself. So let me have a run with this. Let me try. Let me close the door on myself for a year or two or three or four. Let me give up what I like to give up happily to practice and to sit down and memorize all of these works and all of these notes. And let's see. And if I cannot do that, I will tell you, if I cannot do that to share it with was public with hundreds and thousands of people, at least I have had a wonderful journey of discovery that I really cannot do that. Knowing your limitations is a blessing. It's often more important than knowing your, what you are able to do. Um, but so far, I think I haven't had that, that wall. I haven't ran into a wall, I guess, that I could not take down. And if that teaches me anything, um, when you have faith, when you have courage, when you know what you're doing, when it's not just naive, um, empty statements, and when you work hard, and this is the one thing I really learned from Rachmaninoff or from Beethoven or from Chopin, because those people, those people worked extremely hard under incredible circumstances. If you look at Beethoven, Beethoven could have stopped 25 years earlier than when he died, when his hearing was already going out. He still wrote, this is my duty to my art. This is my duty to my fellow men to keep working, to keep writing. The poor man was suffering. He was deaf. At the end of his, his life, God knows what kind of ulcers or stomach cancer he was dealing with. His, Stomach was basically cut open for three months because of all the infections, all of the lead poisoning, all of the horrible things that he was going through. He was still working to the last breath. And if those people could do that, who am I to, to give up so quickly? I mean, you're offering, I know uh, I want to touch on this briefly here in a moment because you teach at college, college, in addition to teaching music, there's a lot of life lessons you can offer students and, you know, current musicians, future pianists and uh, talented folks. But just that sense of not giving up, I'm reminded of somebody, very different circumstances we had on the podcast, a woman Lisa Blair, who uh, is an Australian woman who sailed around Antarctica in a sailboat. I mean, this, this is like the worst oceans in the world. You know, yeah. massive storms, as she would say, she's like five foot two, not mm. particularly physically adept in terms. She's not like six foot, you know, some massively strong. She's, you know, mm. she thinks of herself as not very special but she has a very special at attitude. That's really her superpower. It's not a physical stature. And she defines failure the way you do, which mm -hmm. is failure is not trying. You mm -hmm. know, so yeah. long as I'm giving it my all, I'm giving it my level best, then that's not failure. Yeah. And that's Absolutely. something that young people, and just what you said, really need to understand. So often, you know, uh, you know what they say, it's better to have tried and failed than never to have tried. I mean, maybe you'll fail. But you'll, you'll certainly fail if you don't try, right? I'm sure you've probably Absolutely. given that message a million times to young people. You, you know, and that's the, and sometimes you'll fail, but sometimes you won't. And it's like, right. it's like, what if I fail? The, the the response is, but what if you don't? Right, right. And even if you do, so what? Right, right. Exactly. It it doesn't define you. And if you are going into life expecting that it will be a Disney movie perfect, then you know, it's better to, <laughs> it's better really to wake up. Even in Disney, there are some hard times. And uh, my best word of advice that really comes to mind when, when Edison says, I didn't fail 2,000 times to make a light bulb work, I found 2,000 ways 
not to make a light bulb or because knowing what not to do is extremely helpful. And and that's an a very I love that you you bring that that up. People often think um, you know somebody in Hollywood or a pianist oh they were sort of an overnight success. Well, there's no such thing. You know, not I mean in most cases, yeah. Edison's a great example. In a lot of the creative arts, and you would know much better than I would about composers. But typically, as you've described with Beethoven or Mozart, there's hours and hours and years and years of intense work that leads to what we might think is some of the greatest masterpieces of music ever written. You know, greatness typically doesn't happen easily. You know, well, you've got to have some talent, but it requires a massive amount of hard work. You know? Exactly. And the other quote that I really love is from Beethoven, who said, I am only 10% talent and 90% hard work. And um, like you said, being successful at anything, it just comes with sweat and blood. And another great lesson I learned from my dad, reaching the top of your mountain is comparatively easy by staying to the on the top of your mountain so it's not once you accomplish something you are done and you you leave and that's it and i think this this is part of the challenge or maybe this is also why i like to keep looking for new challenges because feeling that okay i already did that i have nothing else to do then you're kind of emotionally dead or you're kind of intellectually dead you ha life is still full of so many great things but this is also the same thing in chess i was just watching a bobby fisher interview you know, and uh, mm -hmm. and the, the 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 host is asking him well what's now for you You're already the the champion of the world and he says well i have to find something to do i cannot just sit for three years till my <laughs> game and the same was you know with pushkin or dostoevsky or Tchaikovsky yeah. or rachmanov yeah. or, or beethoven or bobby fisher so yeah so just talk about as we you know begin to close here with a Carthage. Yeah, I was going to say, I yeah. normally say at this point, <laughs> the captain's turned on the fasten seatbelt signs, and it's about time to land the plane. The best I have here is that we're approaching the coda uh, of, of the performance of our <laughs> of our conversation. Yeah, I, I, I before think this, we do, I was going to say we're probably coming towards the last movement or something at the pace. So. Yes, <laughs> yes. Before we do that, and Warwick asks his question though. Yeah. YL, I want to give you the opportunity to let listeners know where they can find you online and find out more about you. So where can they go to find out more about you? Thank you, Gary. Uh, so my website, ylfarouk.com, W-A-E-L, F as in Frank, A-R-O-U-K.com, where I have my um, past performances, recent performances, calendar of upcoming events, my YouTube channel, Again, just writing my my name, um, my website at Carthage College or uh, at Roosevelt University, and um, yeah, fabulous. Thank you. So, just talk as we close here at Carthage College. We obviously love playing music and just you know, helping people understand the joy of some of these incredible pieces, whether it's you know Rachmaninoff, Chopin, Beethoven, and all of the other ones you play. But yet you also teach. Talk about how teaching students at Carthage College gives you joy. What what about that? I mean, you know, you, you could just play music, but there's something about that that clearly you love teaching yeah. students about music. What is it about that that you love? Yeah. Well, that's a great question. Um, there are so many nuances here. Teaching is also learning at the same time because it's two-way street. Uh, finding, there are certain things that I do naturally and I do instinctively when I play and certain things perhaps that I didn't find very much challenging, right? Certain things I did find challenging, but when you meet with a student who comes from various backgrounds, some come from, you know, um, that they just been taught by fabulous teachers they have no problems technically psychologically musically and some others have deficiencies in one or all of those three areas and then having to think first of all analyze just like a physician when you go and dealing with with different patients with different symptoms 
analyze that, trying to understand it, trying to find the antidote. Um, and sometimes the first one works great. Sometimes the 10th one only works great. Um, but going through these classes, discovering new ways of new verbalizations of new ways or, or of demonstration how to get the information how to understand how the hand and the body and the brain work it's it's a very complicated very complicated job uh, much more so than some people um, think especially if you do it on a professional level not just in a recreational you know for 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 hobby or therapeutically but going through that and at the same time, because we deal with, with a great wealth of history, right? And or at least what I like to do when, when I teach music, when I teach piano, that I don't just work with a student on this Chopin concerto or this Chopin ballad. We get to know who Chopin was. We get to know about the French Revolution. We get to know about the Polish Revolution. We get to know about the the Russian uh, invasion of, of Poland and, you know, 1840 and, you know, the the 80 year war, the 30 year war, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. What did Franz Liszt stand for politically? What did Rachmaninoff stand for politically? What, how, because those people were were timekeepers and were mirrors like all artists of what was happening culturally um in terms of history in terms of their own um as their own view of the world and you probably cannot find a better time capsule than that because they are very accurate mm -hmm. so we we delve in, into all of that and of course that really shapes the life of a young person in in a wonderful mm -hmm. way and also knowing that no matter what challenges you have mentally, emotionally, physically, we all have our scars on the inside or the out. But again, that does not mean that you cannot do something if you don't apply all your faculties to it. But seeing at the end that critical faculties develop in them, seeing that they become their own teachers in a way because it's one thing to tell somebody okay here is you solve the problem here is what you should do here is you how you prepare for a piece how you prepare for an, a competition for an audition for a concert but to work with them over the two or three or the four years you have sometimes longer to become their own teachers because no matter what a great teacher you study with at the end of the path you are on your own but if you know how to Take care of yourself personally, musically, artistically, and always grow, always find new information to always learn, to always um, develop. I think this is very, very, very rewarding. It's hard work. It takes a lot of time, especially it takes a lot of time away from your practicing. <laughs> but it is our responsibility in a way because I was giving so much by all my teachers, freely and lovingly, and I wouldn't trade this for the world um, and I spend time with my teacher more than I spend with my parents and um, and I'm just proud and, and honored to be given an opportunity to present something like that to somebody else. Mm. Wow. That okay. sounds a lot like a maestro hitting his final note right there. That's what that sounds like to me, listeners. Um, before we go, um, I want to leave you listeners with something that before we hit record on this episode, Warwick and YL were, were talking about, and they were joking. They were laughing that their initials are the same Warwick Fairfax and YL Farouk. And we have guests, as, as you've heard me say before, we have guests fill out these forms to help us prepare for the podcast. And we ask a number of questions. And one of the questions that we ask is, what's one bit of advice you would give listeners to help them overcome crucibles? And this is what YL wrote. But what, what struck me about it as I was reading it is that this quote, I could take this quote and I could put, it was said by the initials WF and you wouldn't know whether it was Warwick Fairfax or it was YL Farouk who says it. And here's the quote, our lives in many ways are defined by how we act in the face of suffering and calamity. We are bound to go through rough waters, but this is for the good. What helped me go through all of my challenges is my faith and love for God, my family, 
and my work. That, listeners, defines both of the men that you've heard talking on this conversation today and beyond the crucible. And until we're together the next time, listeners, um, if you want to know more about crucible leadership and about beyond the crucible, we've got some exciting things you can discover at our website, crucibleleadership.com. There's, there's lots of new content, lots of new information coming. Go check us out. Check those things out because you'll be, um, you'll be excited, I think, by what you'll see. And, and again, until the next time we are together, remember what we've discussed here, the truth of what we discussed here. Your crucibles are painful. What Y.L. discussed was painful to him, has been, continues to be painful to him, but is so far from not the end of his story. And it's so far not the end of your story. Because if we learn the lessons from our crucibles, if we apply the lessons from our crucibles, it's not the last chapter of our story. It can be the beginning of a new chapter that can lead to the best chapter of our lives because the end result where we get to that destination is where Warwick's ended up, is where YL's ended up, and that is at a life of significance.